great honour to be first up at Major Titans. Uh, it was a great event last year. Uh, I hope we do you proud. Um, so what we'd like to talk to you about today is kind of how and the why of composable Magento. Um, composable applications is something that other languages have had or had from the very beginning. PHP has moved into this space and Magento is moving into this space, either driven through the community in the, in the 1.0 product or at the heart of Magento 2. So we have a bit of a, a presentation for you that will cover some of the, the principles around uh, composable applications. Um, and that insight is uh, coming from James, my colleague, who's a technical team lead running a Magento 2 project, uh, one of the first for the UK, and myself as CTO of Session Digital, who's, you know, my role is very much about building teams and building the quality of our delivery. So hopefully that insight is of use. Um, but I want to start by kind of discussing a concept that we're taught really early as engineers or as programmers. Um, it's a watchword for pretty much everything that drives our industry. Reuse. Uh, write code so it can be reused, repurposed. Now this is why we have modular patterns, why we have inheritance, why we have extension points. Um, in fact, it's, you know, it's, I've been heard to state many times in public and in private that a lazy engineer is a good engineer. Don't do things more than once. But I think reuse <laughs> is probably a myth, a fallacy driven through misunderstanding. Um, and it's a, a, a misunderstanding of that principle of don't repeat yourself or dry, you know? Uh, that's often considered maybe we want to avoid copy-paste. We want to avoid duplication of code. Um, but it's a really subtle, subtle principle. And we tend to think of, of just that code duplication level when we should be thinking about you know, what's the knowledge that we're capturing in that code? Where are we representing the knowledge that our application has of the business domain in which it operates? So, if we bear that in mind, and there's a, you know, the, the, the concept itself is covered in great detail in uh, The Pragmatic Programmer by uh, Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt, that's where it originated. Um, but we kind of need to look at what causes us to think like this. And in PHP with object orientation, inheritance is the drug that keeps on giving until it doesn't. Um, it does give us reuse. It lets us type fewer keystrokes to give objects behavior. Then we end up with a really tight coupled tree. Magento 1, perhaps. You can't reuse much of the code in that framework. You can't repurpose it and reapply it because you have an inheritance tree to deal with. So, then language and uh, software maintainers created new concepts. They created tra uh, traits. They developed patterns of mix-ins. Sound good, tastes bad. Especially when they're used ineffectively or to, to achieve the wrong things. I'm not saying they shouldn't be used. I'm just saying that you know, sometimes it's a false sense of accomplishment. And um, if you've heard me talk previously uh, at other conferences, I really favor composition. And I think Vinay, your talk last year really covered the, the concept of composition. The great deal of flexibility through breaking those inheritance chains and favoring the way you compose your application at a code level. We're going to elevate that up now to how we compose an application. So what we're talking about is how we stop rewriting a given feature or a given behavior, start encapsulating that down to its smallest part and allow you to rebuild that back up into an application stack. And if we're going to start using composition, we must start respecting interfaces and building interfaces. Providing a contract of interaction, the shape of input and output, um, and how things will work together. So, what's, you'll see a theme in my slides, I'm a big fan of Lego. Uh, what's the Lego interface? It's not the shape of the brick. It definitely isn't the shape of the brick. They don't all inherit from being a brick. The interface is the bumps and the sockets. 
and everything in the middle is an adapter between the bump and the socket. So that's how they can have such a varied set of objects. I mean, I did actually look online as to how many part numbers they have. It's a big number, and the only common factor between them is that interface. Everything in between is an adapter. So you can have a spectacular re uh, level of reuse and varied application from a really simple concept. And then you can start to build those up into more modular reusable components. Um, and that's where Magento started from uh, Magento Connect. So I'm going to hand you over to James, who's going to cover off some of the, the technical elements of Magento, and then I'll come back shortly. So, module reuse started in Magento with Connect. Connect was a great place put into Magento 1 to allow us to take these packages of code, parts of the systems that we wanted to reuse, put them into Connect, and allow us to reuse that in many different places. But we all know that Connect wasn't the, the destined child we wanted it to be. It was too easy for people to click and install, and it got us not thinking about how we can reuse products or parts of our application. It was more about how we can just put it in there and, and people can use it at will. And we, we didn't really use it. I know we didn't use it a lot and not many places actually took the advantage of having Connect there to use their common pieces of code and interchange it between projects. And at around the same time, Pair was born. So Pair was based on the PHP library repository technology and it was the first attempt at making components inside of PHP reusable. We took advantage of it and started putting some of our Magento packages inside of Pair to be installed, but it was still quite clunky. It was mainly legacy code that found its way into Pair, and thankfully Pair's been closed down. But then Colin Molyneux decided that it was easier for him to build a script to actually put these modules that he was building. He didn't want to keep having to reinvent the wheel each time he started a new project. And he saw that a lot of people were having to do the same. It was time consuming to copy and paste. So he initially built Modman, which was a series of bash scripts that at the first um, incarnation, all it could do was pull down the free components from Magento Connect. But at least it was simple to actually type Modman name of the package we wanted, and it was a repeatable, versionable process that we could take a package from Connect and put it into our project and not really have to worry about copy-paste and getting um, file locations wrong. And over time, Modman actually evolved to the stage where we could actually put our own packages in version control and Modman could link into the correct location. So it wasn't just Connect packages, it was pieces of code that we were developing that we thought were useful for people. And that was great, it served a purpose, and it's actually still serving a purpose today. A lot of projects I look at have still got Modman files because it seems to be the de facto of installing reusable packages in projects. And Modman, strangely enough, predates Composer. So Composer, um, Modman was actually first, the first commit to their repository was in 2010. And Composer, which we all take for granted now, only started in 2011, so Modman predates Composer, which is, is pretty cool that Magento was pushing some of these notions forward in what we, we take for granted today. But in 2011, Jordi, I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name, blah, 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 um, started out creating a solution for the community. He looked around at some of the more established um, PHP framework languages that were out there and saw that they had this problem. They were always creating pieces of code that you either decided to reinvent yourself or had to go through a series of hoops to put on, online for people to share. So he wanted to create a package that was easy for people to install components into their projects regardless of what the project was. And he also wanted a tool that managed dependencies. So we all installed dependency A, but dependency A has got a dependency on another module. He wanted to take away all that pain and make it a single tool that we could go away and install and manage dependencies so that we focused on our application Dependencies make our lives easier. We don't rely on them to do the business domain that we're trying to specify on. And this looked great. We all, I, I know I looked at Composer and thought, yes, it's the answer to our prayers. Don't need to worry about bash scripts. I can use Composer like I do for Symfony or Laravel projects. But Magento <coughs> won't ship with 
a strange auto loader. So it was really difficult for us to tap into the Magento One auto loader to be able to pull our packages in. Um, Compose deals with PSR auto loading, which Magento One doesn't really handle very well unless you hack the core. And there wasn't really a way of us going to Packagist, taking those modules and putting in, them into our project so that we didn't have to reinvent daytime, we didn't have to invent PDF manipulation, all the stuff that we don't like doing because they don't really add extra value to ourselves. And thankfully, I know quite a few people in this room actually committed to the Magento Hackathon Composer project, and I've been one of them and countless others in the room, have actually over time helped make this project where it is today. So, in simplest terms, the Hackathon project is so simple, it's a layer of abstraction on top of Composer that makes Composer aware of Magento modules. So a Magento module has to live in app code, local, Thankfully not for Magento 2. Um, but the Hackathon Composer project actually knows about where these files live and it can, on installation, detect that it's a Magento module and put it in the correct place. So for the first time, we actually had these tools working in sync. We sort of had module reuse. We could take packages from one project, put it in our own private Git repository, and we could reuse it quite simply. We know that we had a composer.json file there that was version to the versions that we required for that project, and we could reliably and repeatedly bring those, those dependencies into our project. But there was no real way of searching, so we couldn't actually search for a PDF or sales library, um, some of the AOE modules, unless we went into GitHub or on Connect, there was no way of us finding them. So the guys created a Fiagento, a Satis repository, which is where we can find all of the free Connect packages, as well as all of the packages that any developer actually wants to add themselves. It's as simple as creating a pull request, modifying the Satis file, and your projects then on packages.fiagento.com to search for anybody to use. And it's not just a single install, it's the versioned install because it's using Composer. You can go through version one, two, three, bug fixes, minor fixes, and because we're using Composer to install those, it's a lot safer and more maintainable. And while we're there, it's really important to actually talk about versioning. So I know we're more about how we can compose projects, but versioning is a massive part of how modules get distributed. For a long time, I'd save a file, bump the version number up, and like, yeah, I've released version two because I fixed the typo. I didn't really think about how my module version number was being communicated to people that were consuming my module. So a couple of years back, the semantic version in Manifesto came out, which dictates how we should follow version numbers in best practice. It states that the first primary number is a major release. Major releases are allowed to contain um, backwards compatibility breaks because it's a brand new version. So if we look at Magento 1, that's uh, version 1.0. When Magento 2 comes out, because we can't just upgrade and go and drink beer, it's a full rewrite, it's backwards compatibility break, so Magento 2 is 2.0. We've then got the minor version. Minor versioning can communicate to people that we're adding functionality. It's not a brand new build of this dependency, we're adding functionality to it. Um, all the previous existing functionality inside of the module exists as it is, we're not going to break anything. In fact, we shouldn't break anything. If we're incrementing the, major, uh, the minor version, don't introduce backwards compatibility breaks because people are going to consume in their composer.json files anything made a minor or patch version, which leads us to the later number. So anytime you fix a bug in your module, make sure that you increment the patch version. So it'll be 2.1. patch version. And that's how we can communicate how stable or where in development our module is actually at any one time. Is it a brand new build? Are we adding functionality? Should we be pulling in this new functionality? Does our, our project actually require it? Or do we want to make sure we always keep up to date with project bug fixing? Which leads us on to how we can become composable in Magento. Well, we know in Magento 1 it wasn't really an option. I mean, Magento 1's nine plus years old, technology changed. I mean, there was no composer, there was no namespaces, no auto loading as such. Traits were no way there. PHP 5 was pretty much new when Magento 1 started. So we won't look at Magento 1, we'll look at what the guys have been planning for Magento 2. 
and thankfully composition is part of Magento 2's core. If you look at how each one of the Magento 2 modules is structured, theoretically we can install a single Magento 2 module and just use that. So we could pull in in a symphony project the sales tax rules if we wanted to take that business domain. In reality, you'll pull in one module that's got a dependency on the rest of the framework, but the heart's in the right place. And they've gone a step above as well. So they've introduced interfaces or service contracts, which are a way of developers communicating their intent. My module has got this public API, it's gonna do this, 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 and this. And that's how we can tie into Magento 2's extra modules or Magento 2 vendor modules make sure that we don't introduce or they don't introduce breaking changes to our code and we've got a reliable way of communication between the two two parts and magento 2 core introduced dependency injection so it's a way of us actually taking the responsibility of creating these objects away from the objects themselves so we can actually take away and build non-magento specific code and inject that into magento so we could theoretically reuse these objects that we're making, not just in Magento uh, practicalities, but we could take it into a Symfony or Laravel or any e-commerce application because it's the business essence that we're trying to capture in our code. We're not trying to capture lines of if, switch and whatnot. We're trying to capture intent. So I said that Magento introduced service contracts. It's a bit of a strange way of them referring to it, and it, it did catch me out for a while because they call them service contracts, APIs, and we know them as interfaces. But when you start digging into Magento too, it's actually an amazingly powerful tool. If every module, which Magento 2's core modules now 98% support, I think it's 100%, but it's, it's almost there, it means that we can tap into any one of the modules without having to understand what that module does. So if we look at um, the newsletter, we know that there's, by looking in the API folder, a method called getName. We don't care how getName works. We know that its return type is a string. So just by working from that interface, we can build our logic based on that service contract, knowing that we're always going to get a string of name back. Magento core can go away, build the implementation how they want, it can change it as long as it always adheres to that service contract. And that's great, especially when you start looking at the vendors in the wild. So how many times have people um, tried to interface with one of the sales uh, shopping cart modules that are out there or the GIF modules? I know countless times I've added observers onto their code just to make sure I can add a discount. They release a bug fix geez, the world's gone wrong. Nothing works anymore. And it's because there's no contracts. There's no interfaces in Magento 1. But these service contracts in Magento 2 actually serve as a contract between us and them to say they won't break anything, but we promise not to observe their core code. We'll work to your contract. If we go against it, then we're going to have days and weeks of pain. And if they break our backwards compiler, the contract themselves, then it's their fault they have to fix it, but that's where versioning again comes into play. If they introduce a backwards compatibility break, not in a major version, then they need to rethink the model that they're structuring their code deployments for. And dependency injection. It's an area of, of contestion for a lot of people. The Symfony guys want to know why we built our own DI container. The Zen guys can't understand why we didn't use their container. But Magento is so bespoke for what it needed. It required a brand new DI container to deal with all the annotations that it reads and builds, the real-time generation that it needed. So what it actually does is allows us to inject at any one point in time concrete implementations that we might want to change out. Theoretically, we could change our entire database backend from being MySQL to Mongo. Um, we can actually swap out where we deliver newsletters to based on our dependency injection. We can say that we want to swap out MailChimp for Salesforce if we wanted to, just by changing our di.xml and injecting a new dependency. And what that means is that the dependencies that we're injecting into our code are decoupled from Magento. All we're injecting in is the actual functionality to make Magento work to send a newsletter. And because it's got those service contracts again to say that I promise I will deliver a newsletter based on send email. If they all adhere to that single interface, whatever implementation we build for sending newsletters, 
then we can swap them out really interchangeably. And it's a massively powerful feature in Magencell 2 that enables code reuse, module reuse across projects that we're building, but also putting them into packages or other places because these aren't bound to a single place. We can build more and use more of the vendor um, projects. We can use some of the MailChimp ones. Recently, we demonstrated in Hungary how we could use um, Coinbase in a Magento 2 project. And we actually didn't need to write much Magento 2 code. We just compose it required Coinbase slash code, Coinbase. And within two, maybe three hours, we had a working Magento 2 Bitcoin extension where we just wrote a little bit of glue code to make sure that their SDK fitted into Magento 2, which is going to make our development time really good. More testable, more maintainable. We're not reinventing ourselves every time. You don't need to look at the team over there and say, what, what version are you using a MailChimp? Oh, can you send us over the fixes? It's just there. There's no excuse anymore not to require it. And on that side, I'm going to pass you back over to Alistair, who's going to go over more about how we can actually decouple from frameworks. So the sorts of things James has been talking about definitely steepen the learning curve from Magento. <coughs> There's some core concepts to learn. Um, but it, it's a really, those, those concepts are a great facilitator for uh, a different way of working. And one of the things that has, I've seen uh, at different conferences from different frameworks and different languages, much as the framework curators tend to get a bit, a bit angsty about them being on the lineup, but lots of people talking about abstraction away from the framework, which is not, don't use the framework. That's not the statement that's been made. The statement that's been made is, write code that doesn't care where it's being executed. Write code that's portable. It's all about reuse, but it's responsible reuse. Because the minute your code is dependent on Magento, it's only ever going to get used in a Magento project. But imagine you write code that's dependent on Magento 1. It's only going to work in Magento 1, not Magento 2. So the idea of abstracting away from the framework sounds quite positive, but it requires a little bit of work. And that rewiring step, as, as James just mentioned, that's where you adapt your, your, comp your, your abstract components into the framework of, of that time. Um, but that code is minimal, and you're only adhering to those service contracts as described that the framework needs. And you write your code in the simplest form possible. Um, the term a naked module or a naked Magento module is something you'll see from Symfony Framework and I think there's, there's people talking about this in Laravel as well. It's the idea of writing code that has no awareness of the framework it's going to be written in. Um, you know, that would mean it can be applied to new versions of Magento. You're not repeating yourself. Um, and we've got, we've had, we've been kind of looking at this for a a number of months we have modules that we've developed for, for some of our clients that we knew Magento 2 was coming. We didn't yet know what Magento 2 would really look like. It was, it was a moving target. So we could have just carried on writing code the way we, we always had. What are we doing? We're storing up technical debt. We're going to have to pay down sometime later. Or we can abstract away from the framework so that it was an implementation detail later. Um, and then you can draw code in from other frameworks, other libraries. Imagine being able to look to all of PHP's community, regardless of their preferred framework, and take uh, code that someone else has written. Now, one of the things to, to bear in mind there is there may be people who live, breathe tax rules, or live, breathe currency conversion. <coughs> It doesn't mean you have to be an expert in everything anymore, you just have to find the expert and find the code they wrote. And to me this uh, kind of starts to lead on to a discussion around what's, your, what's the value of an engineer. And I think this is kind of a, a maturity exercise in that when you first graduate or you first get into the industry, you know, your value is directly linked to the lines of code you write. And the more code you've written, the more experienced you are, and the more valuable you are. Eventually, you get to, get to a tipping point and you realize, it's not the code I've written, it's my ability to solve problems. It's my ability to solve problems either through writing code or through selecting the right code. And to, to kind of 
step away from code to some extent, or step away from engineer, uh, software engineering, you know, th this has bigger concepts, the concept of ephemeralization, doing more with less. You know, as technology is driving every, in every uh, corner of the world, doing more with less. And I think to be a responsible engineer, you should be minimizing the effort you expend to solve a problem. Minimizing the keystrokes to create a quality solution. And ephemeralization, doing more with less, has been around quite some time. It was a, a concept uh, coined or first described by uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, in 1938, who was, a, who was an American architect, uh, philosopher, inventor. He invented the geodesic dome, and I think uh, then uh, carbon-14 buckyballs was named after. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, but he had this concept of, of DMAS, achieving more with less. And reuse through reduced mass is something we do see in technology. Um, anyone that's, you know, a, you know if, you, if you use Unix, if you use Unix-based systems, you know that the key philosophy of building a Unix, uh, piece of Unix software is that it does one thing, it does one thing really, really well, and it exposes a very constrained interface as to how you use it. Normally, you pipe stuff in and you pipe stuff back out again. You know, it's a very constrained set of things. However, how many different pieces of software can you build from those small bricks? It's like Lego. It only has a single simple interface. So we can be more effective by thinking about doing less. Building less well. Smaller, more focused modules and components are more portable and more reusable. Um, in principle, you know, it's, it's the Unix principle, but you see this in many other places and many other languages. Anyone that uses Node.js will see that they follow the same principle. Now, their package management is at the core of the language. It's not at the core of a, of a framework, it's the core of the language. And the reuse and the availability of code for reuse is the key, one of its keys to success. If we build on that, that physics analogy, then objects with less mass have less inertia, which means it's easier to influence their path, making them much more flexible and usable in unplanned contexts. Now, we cannot predict the future. We can't predict where we want to use our code, but we can use code for re we can build code designed for reuse. Thank you. Hey there, uh, thanks for that. Um, so when you're building modules internally that you're wanting to use between multiple clients, um, how do you make them Composer installable? Do you use the Hackathon installer or do you use something else? Yes, so we use the Hackathon installer mainly because we, we want to use, um, we modify the auto loader so that we can pull in via um, PSR1 and it can load other parts of uh, the PHP ecosystem. We use the Hackathon installer Make sure we use our composer.json mappings so it's a source destination. You can use modman files, but we just prefer to keep it all JSON. And um, most of ours are on our GitHub repository, the public, but um, a few of them are private just for commercial reasons. But yeah, Hackathon installer, GitHub, composer.json, and away we go. Um, so when Magento 2 is out, um, how long do we expect the first version to be supported for? Three years. Right. <laughs> Cheers, Ben. <laughs> I mean, officially for three years from the first from GA. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Tom? Great. I'm just curious, you said you're building the Magento 2 project at the moment. How are you finding 
the changes that they're drip feeding out in terms of breaking the code that you write, you write something on something that's not finished? It's Challenging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> more recently, it's been a lot better. Um, so when we started the project, the, well, I was... Because I'm, I'm just curious in the timeline, because it's changed quite dramatically at certain points. So. Yeah, I mean, Norbert, when did we start together? June. Okay. So yeah, when we first started the first project, um, we decided to go for the checkout first, just because it's the area that caused most pain. And then our funding... Yeah, well our front end team finished their work and then surprise surprise, Beta X came out a day, pretty much a day after they finished and broke everything that we'd done. Uh, but at the moment, I mean for the past two Betas, which have been maybe five, six weeks apart, it's really stable. We haven't, they haven't introduced any bugs that have affected our code, but we're also now more educated to use the service contracts, so in theory they shouldn't break anything. But it's definitely um, something that you, I've seen many teams learn is that when you're using Composer, um, you, you start by writing your Composer, Composer JSON file and you specify the versions you want. And initially you think, well, I'm, de I'm developing, I'm going to use some fairly open restrictions on which versions I will pull into my project. Um, which sounds like, okay, that means it's easy during development, I'll keep seeing the upstream changes flow into my project. Yeah, don't do that. Um, so it will it will lead to pain. It's 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 what um, many different languages have felt. You know, you, if you don't pin those restrictions pretty keenly at the beginning, uh, because humans don't follow Semver. You know, Semver has a purpose. It would work if everyone followed it. But the one thing you can rely on is nobody will follow it. So protect yourself when you're building your project and pin your versions explicitly. And then when you think there's a new version that will either add value, fix a bug, close a security hole, then you explicitly pull in that new version by changing to, to the version you think will work. That gives you the option of then uh, running incremental uh, upgrades and check validating that everything still follows the service contracts and that the APIs haven't changed. Uh, otherwise, you'd be chasing bugs for a while. I was that guy. <laughs> For our Magento, first one I put, um, Composer, uh, Magento 2 framework, start. Well, hey, we'll just do an update every day, get all the updates, and yeah, Norbert nearly killed me. <laughs> so now, read up on semantic versioning because it's, it's really important. It's only a short web page, but as soon as you understand like the major, minor, and patch version, and you can see in Composer how it's got its different wildcard matches, it saves time, um, and it saves time. Yeah. It does, but remember, Humans are in there as well. Yeah. Thanks, guys.